So if you have your Bibles with you, you might want to open to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the first 23 verses of this, uh, of this chapter. We're dividing it into two mainly because the content is just too much. There's too much content to, uh, to put it all into one message. Of course, you remember from our study of chapter 1 and, and looking back even before that, you remember Daniel and the events surrounding uh, the nation of uh, Judah, as it was, the southern two tribes in Israel, and their uh, captivity uh, to, uh, to Nebuchadnezzar and, and to the people of Babylon. And the traumatic events that led to all of this, nothing, nothing happened quickly, nothing happened uh, easily, but his nation had been defeated. As far as Daniel was concerned, his nation had gone into captivity. All of the great promises of God that had been fulfilled to install them in the land of Canaan, all was now gone. The northern ten tribes had long since gone into captivity. But the southern two tribes were left as like a remnant in the land. And now even they, because of their disobedience to God, uh, were, were taken away captive and defeated. The temple in Jerusalem had been ransacked and items from it taken and put into the storehouses of the false gods of the Babylonians. And he, along with many of the others from his nation, had been taken captive away from his home. His name even did not survive the trip because his name, Daniel, meaning judge of God, had been changed to Belteshazzar by the people of Babylon. Bel protects his life. That's what it means. It was a, it was a not so subtle slap on the side of uh, Daniel's face to remind him that as far as the Babylonians were concerned, Bel was the god that should be worshipped. Of course, this didn't phase Daniel. Daniel was a man of faith in the one true God of heaven. And he, his faith was not shaken by any of these circumstances. We know that to be true because of chapter 1. Chapter 1 showed how even as a young man, Daniel was willing to make a stand. He was willing to take a stand. He was willing to be put front and center along with his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were willing to be put forward and to be put to the test for God. It was actually God who was being put to the test uh, by the people, but Daniel was happy for that person to be uh, him that people were looking to, even though it could have meant his life. And you recall how in chapter 1 uh, they requested that they be given vegetables to eat, things that grow from the ground. And you recall, of course, that at the 10-day time limit for the test, they were found to be full of flesh and fat and, and looking healthy, uh, more so even than those who ate and dined uh, basically at the king's table with the king's portion of meat. So God had proven himself to Daniel. Not that he needed to. Daniel trusted God implicitly, but... Daniel put himself on the line for God, and God proved himself in that way. And all of that would be most important, because the events coming the next year in the life of Daniel would be even more frantic and troublesome. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, we're going to begin this morning by reading that first verse. And it basically sets the scene for us for this morning's message. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Now that's an interesting situation. Perhaps some of you have dreamed dreams that you uh, wake up from in fright. Uh, I know I have over the course of my life. I think we call them nightmares. <laughs> you, uh, you wake up in shock and you know you, 
you feel like you've just been through whatever scenario you were dreaming. And dreams are common to men. Uh, let's face it, it could be something you ate, it could be anything. But what was distressing Nebuchadnezzar, who was not a believer in God, by the way, uh, what was distressing Nebuchadnezzar was a message from God. Now, if any man receives a message from God, there is going to be anguish and angst, certainly amongst God's own people. Uh, everyone who is in the presence of God, we see, at least in the Bible, falls to their knees, falls to their face before Him. They consider themselves unworthy to be in His presence much less someone who does not know God, who does not recognize Him, who does not reckon Him to be anything. And Nebuchadnezzar was just such a man. But God had a word to say. And would it surprise you that if I told you the things that were said to Nebuchadnezzar were prophecies that were going to unfold over centuries? revealing to an ungodly man prophecies uh, that were going to be constantly unveiling and unrolling. God was basically showing Nebuchadnezzar the line of history from his time all the way to the time of the end. All the way to the coming of Jesus Christ, that great cornerstone who was set in his position, who created his New Testament church on this earth and, and beyond. Do, do we feel a little bit um, a little bit angry that God would reveal such things to uh, unsaved men, to men who do not regard God? We shouldn't because the messages to Nebuchadnezzar are messages to us as well. And we have that dream that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. We understand them. But when God has something to say, men's hearts tremble in fear. Think about when God spoke uh, to the nation of Israel, when he, when he descended upon uh, the mountain. Remember, it trembled and it smoked and it burned. And he, he called... Uh, Moses up to him in, in that mountain but people were afraid they were running the other way and they were, they were closing their ears and saying please don't, don't speak to us anymore it's too much for us such, such it is with God that his word commands respect even to a man who does not regard him he dreamed a dream, the Bible tells us, and his spirit was troubled. I like this word troubled because it's one that maybe you can identify with. It means to tap or to get someone's attention by slapping their hand. That, that kind of can irritate you, I guess, from time to time. You know, when you've got a little child beside you and they want to talk to you and you're talking to someone else and for, for me, that's, uh, that's the dog. That's what the dog does to me. You're supposed to play. And the tapping, the constant tapping, and, and trying to get the attention, that's the idea of the word. God was trying to get the attention of Nebuchadnezzar. He had something to say to him. Now I imagine, because the Bible talks of dreams here in the plural, that that night, he had many dreams. And uh, I don't know about you, I don't get so much good sleep when I dream a dream, whether it's good or bad. I just don't feel like I've gotten much rest. And very seldom have I dreamed the same dream the same night. You know, wake up from the dream, go to bed and dream it again. I can't, in fact, I can't remember one time now where it's happened to me, but this must have happened multiple times to Nebuchadnezzar. He sleeps, he awakes from the dream, he can't recall the dream, but he, 
he knows that it was it was something important it was something pressing and more importantly because it was from God though he did not know this it, it had an urgency about it it would be like trying to remember something that's a life or death matter for you Nebuchadnezzar had those dreams that night and they troubled him they tapped on him they they uh, agitated him because he couldn't recall it. his sleep the Bible says break from him and that that simply means to leave and, and, and to leave quickly his, his sleep was long gone now I can't sleep now I might as well get up because what has happened the dream that I dreamed in the night has me perplexed and I can't remember what it was it was important so important but I can't remember it. And of course, if this happened to any one of us, we would go about our day, we would still be agitated and worried, but you know, the very few consequences on other people. But because this was Nebuchadnezzar and not just any normal uh, Babylonian, there was trouble to be had. <clears throat> The common results of conviction we can see here in verse 1, though. It, it's worth stopping just a moment to think about that. You know, when God convicts us of our sin, and, and he, He's beginning to work in us, we know that things are not right. It, it's, it's easy. Men, men have some sort of uh, inbuilt uh, device by God that lets them know when things are and when things aren't right. Now, sometimes they don't work for people, right? Some people don't have the ability to maybe sort of read the, read the room very well, I guess. But you know, you can be around someone and think, you know, this, we're having good fellowship, chatting back and forth and talking. And that, that tells your spirit, it tells your, your inner man, you know, this is good. It's good that we're communing, that we're having fellowship, that, that we're talking together. And you walk away from those conversations and go, man, I really enjoyed that. I'm glad I saw that person. I'm glad I met them. You ever stumbled into someone uh, as you're going around doing your daily chores, maybe at the, at the shops or something like that, and you see someone, and you say, how has it been going? And, and you, you break into that fellowship and the joy, and you walk away with a smile on your face. Sometimes it's easy to read the room. Sometimes you can come around someone and go, and, and you're your normal self, but you notice something's not quite right. You don't know what it is. Can't put your finger on it, but it's not the same. It's not like it normally is when we fellowship and chat together. Now, that could be many things. They could have something on their mind weighing on them, right? That, heavy upon them and and it and it's causing them not to invest in the conversation it could be that they have something against us that maybe we've done something wrong or something that is perceived to have been done wrong and so but we normal normally we can we can sense when things are not right we go I'm kind of worried now. I've just met with this person and said hello and I've walked away and now, now I feel a bit worried. I, 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 it just doesn't seem right. That's because we have that ability from God to discern such things. And the more you read and study the Bible too, the better, the better you'll become at reading those things with people and you, you the more you practice it as well the, the better it will become but the results of conviction are all over what we see here I was troubled were you yes when when sin was made known to me and, and I saw myself as a sinner I was troubled I didn't know exactly why I should be troubled because the sermon had only gotten so far as to say that 
you're not acceptable as you are to God. We know that we are not right with God. That's probably the most damaging thing. It's, it's the tapping in the heart of man that says, something's not right. Something's not right. You have to make this right. And I remember that feeling for many days, and especially for three days in particular, where it, it was almost <clears throat> as if I couldn't escape. I couldn't get away from it. Also, to feel the greatest effects is to be alone. I know that's what it was with me. When I was alone, my mind would go back and it would begin to consider those things again. And I would remember the things that were said, the things that were urged on me to call on the name of the Lord. And I, I knew I hadn't done it. And so this was also troubling me. It was trouble added to trouble. And my heart was burdened because of it all. Everything was heavy. It was as if I, as if I was being pressed down. And my sleep broke from me. That's not to say that I didn't sleep. But I can tell you I didn't sleep much. It, it was fitful. I was afraid to close my eyes because I was afraid I might die. I knew I wasn't right with God and I was afraid, honestly, that I might die. And as I've told you before, I was confused at that time. I didn't know much about the Bible, uh, but I thought that the offer for salvation was made in church. I didn't realize a person could be saved wherever they were. And so I was biding my time, waiting for the next service. I didn't even know they had a Wednesday night service. I didn't even know there was such things. And I got invited to a revival meeting on a Wednesday night, and that's where I was saved. You know why I was saved there and not at the church where I heard the gospel for the first time? Well, it's because that was the next church service that I was at. I was determined I was going to be saved at the next church service. I knew how they worked. I'd been to one and I knew how it worked and I was going to bide my time and I was going to be saved. And I was worried because there was so much time between here and there. I can, I can sort of uh, uh, get, a, get a feeling of Nebuchadnezzar's sense of of desperation because he didn't even remember the dream that's what makes it so bad he didn't even under, didn't even remember what it was that he dreamed but he knew it was important and the king sought answers this is the difference between a king having a dream like that especially in those days where they had ultimate power and someone like you or I having the dream where we're left to work it out for ourselves. Let's look and see what he did. Verses 2 through 21. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream. And my spirit was troubled to know the dream. And the spirit, then the spirit of the Chaldeans, uh, then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show thee the interpretation. Oh my goodness, there are a thousand books in the world. Interpret your dreams. Can you imagine these magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers it, it, it's, all, it's all a bunch of foolishness. Let's, let's look at these words. Ma the word magician. It means literally a horoscopist. Draw, people who draw magic lines or circles. So uh, if, if you think about a horoscope, people look to the skies and they see in the skies the signs. You're born under certain signs. You see how they're, they're drawing, they're making connections between the signs. And they talk about when, when, this, uh, when this symbol is in this. In other words, they're looking at the stars that God created. And, and that, that he, 
call us to be by his word from nothing. And they think that these things are going to give them the answers. The word astrologers means a conjurer. A conjurer. <laughs> Unbelievable. The word sorcerer, a whisper to whisper a spell. That's what it means to encant or to practice magic. All of these things God has forbidden. All of them. And yet they use them to try to discern, understand what God is saying. What, what has God said about such things? That these things are nothing in the world. God set the, the moon and the sun and the stars in the sky for times, for dates, to show men when daytime starts, when nighttime starts. These are there for seasons. They have their purpose. God created them for a purpose. But leave it to man to try to make that be the thing that directs our lives. And it was an impossible riddle. But, but I, can, I can see these astrologers and these conjurers, they're all going, oh, this is right up our alley. This is where we shine. Tell us your dream, O king, and we will tell you what it means. You know, the, this, is, this is the constant uh, for all of these conjurers and astrologers and, and these, these people who deal in dark and black magic. It's, it's their, it's their uh, order of business to, to take what you have and to change it to hurt you or to have an advantage over it. Nebuchadnezzar shocked them, though, when he said in verse 4, or in verse 5, rather, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. And now, that, that's interesting. The dream I can't remember. The one like you have in the night that you can't recall. I don't remember it. The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream... With the interpretation of thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. This is the whole purpose. You see, this was a very fragile existence because to not be able to reveal what the king wanted to know, that's why you were there. That was your whole purpose. He provided for you. He looked after you. He took care of you. But you had to do what you said you could do. And I love the protestations of these uh, magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers. And so he says here in verse 6, But if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that ye would gain the time. He's saying, I know that you're trying to buy time, that you're trying to get a little bit of time together to, to put something together so you can talk to me. Because you see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me uh, till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the, king, the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth. 
and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Now, how much slaying took place in, in the time from that meeting of those uh, who happened to be in the court at the time of the dream of the king? Because Daniel evidently was not in the court. I don't know for what reason, but he wasn't in that place. He had no knowledge of this. But there would have certainly been a wave of death passing across Babylon. As the decree would go forth, they would seek out these men and they would kill them. So you would say, well, that's it. You know, David or Daniel, it's been nice to know you. you you've proven God before them and now God is seeing fit to take you home. But Daniel was a man of faith. Daniel, as we saw from chapter 1, was a man of purpose. He determined in his heart, remember, not to defile himself. But the decree went out nonetheless to destroy the wise men, of which Daniel and uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions from that great captivity, were, were among those that were called uh, the wise men. The impossible riddle, the death of those that uh, were unable to, uh, to tell the king the dream, and a decree to destroy. The Bible says here in that, talking about that, that he was angry. Uh, these are interesting words, that he was angry and very furious. The word angry means to be enraged in oneself. You know when you have that indignant hate and it, it builds up in you and you're just so angry. But some people are wise, I suppose, and they can contain it. You know, they can hold it in like a, like a burning flame <clears throat> inside an oven, I suppose. They can keep it in. But Nebuchadnezzar was not like that. He was a man that when he raged and burned like that, it spilled out on every side. It was like a bomb going off, he says. And it, he was very furious. It means to burst open in rage toward others. And there were lives, no doubt, that were lost uh, early on in that peace. And I want you to see that Nebuchadnezzar was a lot like us trying to solve his problems, which, which were with God. He first went to the world. How many of us first went to the world? Oh, I did. I, I don't suppose I, I thought that I was doing it, but I tried to be a better person. I remember growing up knowing that, you know, I, I'm not perfect. I knew I was a sinner. I wouldn't tag that word onto it because I didn't necessarily know and understand what that word meant. But I knew, you know, that, that I, I wasn't a perfect person. And at times I'd try to be better. I try to be a better person than I was the day before. And you know, sometimes it would work for a day or two, sometimes it wouldn't. That's just the nature of a person trying to heal themselves. I, I even uh, got books from people who were motivators, you know, uh, to get things done, do this, do that. I picked up those books and I read them. There's some good, good advice in there from the world, I suppose. but. You know, it, it didn't solve my problem. It didn't make me better. I may have done some things better, but it didn't make me better. Because what was wrong with me was wrong in, in, in spirit. I was dead. So he goes to the world first. He goes to the astrologers. He tries to find the answer. And you know what? People are spending their whole lives looking at those things for answers. Not, not just to their soul's great need, which is salvation, but to the, to the things of life. God's people 
look into things such as that to help them in their daily life. I want to know how to live, so I, I always look at my horoscope. You know, I always want to know what it tells me to do. You know, avoid, uh, avoid strange, dark places. Be careful of, of strangers offering you money. You know? They, they, they're willing to look at something and someone they don't know. Little do they know that these things are being written uh, by, by people sitting in large homes and, and just trying to think of something for the next day. It's like someone writing a, a cartoon. They have a deadline and they write it out and they send it on. My friends, there's no answers there. There's... All it is is bringing up more questions than answers. That's all the astrologers did. Did they calm the fires that was in Nebuchadnezzar? No, not at all. He was very furious. But finally he turned to Daniel. This, I want to refer to Daniel as the man of God. Now he didn't so much turn to Daniel as he was preparing to kill Daniel. And, and Daniel came before him. But nevertheless... However it happened, Nebuchadnezzar came in contact with Daniel. Because Daniel was a man not afraid. If the man's going to kill me, I mean, think about it practically and pragmatically, right? If the king has sent out uh, his men to kill the wise men, I have nothing to lose. I'm, I'm going to die, so I might as well ask. And Daniel, as he always was, was very circumspect with his words. He knew how to ask questions to elicit the right response. And I don't mean he was, he, he had some sort of un unnatural ability. I just mean that he, he understood the situation. He was able to read the room. They want to kill me. And so he says very patiently, why, why is the king's command so urgent? Why is it why is it so uh, quick and hasty? Let's look at verse 14 of chapter 2. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom. Two great things to use always when you're replying to someone. To Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the men of Babylon. He answered and said to Ariok the king, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Ariok made the thing known to Daniel. So he told him the story of the dream that could not be remembered and how he had tried the astrologers and, and all of those and they were unable to tell. And, and they have been executed. Verse 16, And Daniel, then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time that he would show the king the interpretation. Now, I want to show you the difference between the astrologers and the sorcerers and all of those people asking the king to tell him the dream and Daniel's response to the king. Daniel is basically saying to the king, give me some time and remember what the king said to the sorcerers? I know that you're just trying to buy some time so that you can think up something to say to me or maybe delay me so that this thing passes, you know. Oh, this will pass. Just wait. He'll forget about it next week. Let's just say, you know, let's give a week. This isn't like the governments that we have today where things are just pushed down the road and down the road or, or they do things and, and you don't know that, that they're doing them. This was necessary to be done straight away. But Daniel goes into the king himself. He appears before the king. He doesn't say, tell me the dream. He knows the king doesn't know the dream. And Daniel also knows something about these dreams, that these dreams are often from God, that God has a purpose. God is trying to speak to him. Daniel doesn't mention this, but he's a man circumspect. Nebuchadnezzar is not a believer. So Daniel goes in and he says, Give me time and I will tell you the dream. 
Now he's saying something that none of the others have said. I will tell you what the dream is. Because if you recall, back in Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, in the latter part of that verse, verse it says, And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. All visions and dreams, Daniel had understanding. He was able to, he was able to make heads and tails of them. Just as uh, so, so long before God's people had had that ability to understand and to, to make, uh, make known dreams because God would give the message to them of what the dream was to say. And the dream was from God. We think about uh, Pharaoh's dream and how that God had a message for the nation of Egypt and there was a man ready to answer the call. Joseph was a man who was able to understand. And Daniel is much like Joseph in that he's a captive, brought in, raised up to a, a high position in the nation, and now a chance to, to shine, and to shine for God, which was his great desire. And of course, uh, all of those uh, things brought about a time of prayer. Look at verse 17. Then Daniel, after he had spoken with the king and had gotten his day, I don't know how long the king gave him. It doesn't really say here. Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time. But if you look at verse 17, it appears that God answered the prayers of these men that night. Then Daniel went to his house and he made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. That's why I think there were men dead, because men had perished. They had all died. The, their, the sword had gone through their homes. Their houses were made a dunghill, just as promised. And it says in verse 19, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now notice the difference here between a vision and a dream. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Daniel was given the ability to interpret and understand dreams, both dreams and visions. God answered Daniel's prayer and the prayer of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah by a vision. Different than a dream. A dream is where you fall asleep and you, you have a, uh, a, almost a lifelike uh, experience in the middle of sleep. That's a dream, right? We've all had those different times. This was a vision. This was a vision like Paul had received that vision. Of the man of Macedonia saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And you remember the vision that Daniel had, or that uh, Paul had, he told to his traveling companions. He said, God gave me this vision last night. It was a man decked out in the, in the garb of a Macedonian. And he was beckoning to us to come and help. What do you think it means? And they were all of one accord. That God had assuredly called them for to preach in Macedonia. And so they made a beeline, a straight shot for that place. And ended up in Philippi, the chief city of Macedonia to preach the gospel. And you know the rest of the story. Well, God has so revealed to Daniel in a vision both the, uh, the dream that Pharaoh had, which was no doubt a shocking splendor uh, that, uh, that he saw, but also the interpretation of the dream. All in one night. And I can't prove it by these, by these verses, but the fact that God answered the prayer so quickly, 
I think Daniel put himself to another test. This one wasn't a 10 day test. Give, he didn't say to Pharaoh, give me 10 days and, and I will come back and tell you what the dream means. He just said, give me time. And I'm wondering if that wasn't the movement of the sun in the sky for one time. <clears throat> Give me one day and I'll tell you what your dream is. Imagine it. This could only be done by someone who had put God to the test before. Who had tried God and, and put His Word to the test. And I don't mean try in, in an evil sense, of course. I mean to, to obey and to do and to see what will fall out from it. And my friends, God did not disappoint. The impossible riddle that Nebuchadnezzar uh, had, had received that caused him to lose so much sleep was now an evident thing to Daniel. And not only that, but Daniel was given the meaning of the dream as well. You see, God answers prayer. In Luke 18, 1, Jesus, uh, it is said that he spake a parable uh, to this end, that men are always to pray and not faint. And James 5, 16 tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man that is a man who has the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the only righteousness that we have. That the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There is much avail. Where do your prayers go? Do they, do they go to the ceiling? Do they go to the sky beyond? Do they, do they go into the ear of God? Our Bible tells us that our mm -hmm. Heavenly Father hears us and His heart is bent toward us. He cares for us. He loves us. Prayer changes things. And Daniel knew it. That's why he said, pray. How did they pray? They prayed like their life depended on them. They prayed like if they didn't get an answer, the next day was going to be the day of their death. And we know that with knowledge of those four individuals that they did not fear death in the sense of what was going to happen beyond it. We know that for certain from Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They said, we're going to be delivered. Delivered to whom? Delivered to their God, of course. If, if you cast us into the furnace and, and we burn in the furnace, we're delivered. Either way, God's going to deliver us from you, O King. So these were men who were confident of where they were going. And you and I can be confident like that as well. We, there's no reason for us not to have the confidence in what God has promised. Have we believed on Jesus Christ as our Savior? Do we believe that God raised Him from the dead? The Bible says if we believe, He is faithful and just and will give us everlasting life. So the promise is everlasting life, to live eternally, to be free from the bonds of death. Death has no more dominion or power or fear over us. Because it's simply for us deliverance. I love that the dream was revealed in a night vision. A walking vision, a waking vision rather, shown to Daniel. And Daniel praised God when he saw the vision. He saw it in all of its splendor and its magnificence. And, and I suppose, in a sense, too, it's trouble and, and trial and the great length of time that it referred to. And Daniel said a few things. There are seven things that he mentioned here, and I'm going to 
share them with you. He said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Blessed be his name. Imagine seeing a vision going through to the end of days. Oh, blessed be his name. Wisdom and might are his. This vision was, was shown to him, but also before to Nebuchadnezzar. Wisdom and might are God's. He changeth the times and the seasons. Daniel could look down through the halls of time and see kingdoms rise and fall. And finally, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, who would reign forever and ever. And so he removeth kings. And he setteth up kings. There's a purpose. God has a purpose for this whole, uh, this whole time that remains. And there's a limit to it. Thank goodness. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge unto them that know understanding. If God puts into the minds of men wisdom, wisdom to live and walk and to understand for every challenge that comes god is the source of all that wisdom and he can put it into our hearts and minds and he's put it into our hand through his word <clears throat> he revealeth the deep and secret things things that are beyond men he he can he can tell things that even the man can't remember God can unveil them, and he did. And he knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. He understands everything. This is the God that Daniel served. This is the God that you and I serve. And Daniel closed his thoughts here in a thankful prayer. He said, I thank thee, and praise thee, O God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. I'd love to see Daniel walking back to Nebuchadnezzar's palace. You know? I, I always picture him with a book or tablet under his arm, striding. Not going slow, not saying, oh, let's make the last of our hours. We're gonna, we're gonna make it last. You know, maybe we'll stop off for a coffee along the way and we'll take time. No, he was rushing. I tell you what, when the sun came up the next day, Daniel was up, he was ready to do it. And, and he walks in with boldness before a king who has threatened his life. And he says, these were the visions of thy head upon thy bed. And when the king heard Daniel speak, it was as if a weight was lifted off his shoulders. You know when that thing that you've forgotten finally comes back to you, you realize you don't have Alzheimer's like you thought? It's, it's, it's a peaceful feeling that rolls over the heart of a man to know that the matter is known. And more importantly than that, that God has a message that this man is going to be able to know. There was a reason uh, in, in chapter 1 that Nebuchadnezzar found them to be ten times better than all the rest. It was because they had God. God was going to make himself known. Well, tonight we're going to find out exactly what was made known to Daniel, the substance of that dream, and what that means, what it meant for Bel of what it meant for Daniel, what it meant for Nebuchadnezzar, and what it means for us. Because even you and I have a part in what Nebuchadnezzar saw. God allowed him to look down through the halls of time and see our age in his dream. God has a plan. You see, things aren't just happening haphazard. Things aren't just, well, you know, 
like some people believe, that God has started everything running and He's over here sitting down, or as some people uh, erroneously feel, has, has gone to sleep so that everything just continues on as it was from the beginning. It's just keeping on, keeping on. No, God has a definite timeline. The Father has a timeline when everything is going to be wound up. He has a timeline for the heavens and the earth to be rolled together like a scroll. He has a timeline for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. He has a time for uh, the bestowing of blessings and, and, uh, and rewards for labor. And He has a plan for a great white throne judgment on this earth. The, there, the times and the seasons God has in His hand. But every once in a while, He will reveal them unto us. And this book is the book where God reveals them to us. We don't need anything more than this book. You don't need a prophecy. You don't need a seer. Or you don't need the stars to be in alignment. You need this book and the wisdom that God gives. And God can open up your mind to His plan. And we, don't, we won't know everything perfectly. Are we in God's place? No. But He will show us what we need to know. We'll have exactly what we need. 